Welcome back time to Newcomers Alike to 9 Persons, 9 Hours, 9 Doors. Last episode, this crap happened. In this episode, we will see the outcome of this crap. Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to her. Liar! Freaking pedophile. If she just does what I tell her to, I'll let her go. Yep, definitely a pedo. He started to move backwards slowly, keeping his grip on Clover. Keeping their distance, Junpei and the others followed. Eventually, the man reached the wall. He gave a start as his back touched it, then glanced around quickly and spoke. V verify. Huh? The left. Look on your left. Do you see the device on the wall? Place your hand on the scanner panel. The round part. What if I don't? The man's nostrils flared, and he looked like he was about to choke. What do you think is going to happen, Clover? Good God. Like, uh, are you an idiot? What do you think? That's exactly what I said. Thank you for agreeing with me, Crazy Ninth Man. I could just slit your throat right now. I'll kill you if I have to. All I need is your bracelet. Just do it! Do it now! He pressed the knife against Clover's neck, hard. Slowly, she stretched her left hand out towards the device. Her back was to it, and she had to feel around for a moment before she found the circular panel. It made a cold, electronic noise, and on the display above her hand, an asterisk appeared. So that's how it works, Junpei thought to himself. By placing one's palm on what the ninth man had to call the scanner panel, the user's bracelet number would be entered into the device. Should you total the number on your numbered bracelets, and find that the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that, the door will open. Junpei shifted his eyes to the door itself. The number on it was five. The ninth man seemed to know a little more about the device's operation than he should. How had he known exactly what to do? Good, good. We're done. N next. His bloodshot eyes crept from person to person until finally, they stopped on the lion, Ace. You, right? You're the one with the number one bracelet, right? Yes, I am. So? You're next. Just verify your number like this little brat did. What are you doing? Do it! Don't you care what happens to her? <laughs> He's like, no! <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Just calm down. Ace held up his hands, palms out. The ninth man jerked his chin towards the device. Slowly, cautiously, Ace moved toward the device. After what seemed like an agonizing eternity, he reached it. Now, verify. Ace nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. The device beeped again, and a second asterisk appeared. Now the device had Clover and Ace's numbers. Four and one. Four plus one equals five. The same as the number written on the door. But it wouldn't open just yet. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. The door needed at least one more person. Who would that be? G -g 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 Get back! His voice shook, but the knife he held to Clover's throat made his words a command. Ace took two, then three steps back. No fervor! <laughs> They're like all the way back in the first rooms they were in when he finally decides to go through the door. More than that. Go all the way back. Slowly, Ace did what he was told. The ninth man's lips curled into a cruel, twisted smile. That was when Junpei understood his plan. Clover's four and Ace's one. Added to the ninth man's nine. Four plus one plus nine equals fourteen, and one plus four equals five. Da da! In other words... <laughs> F -f 
thank God you were all so cooperative. Now I can get out of this nightmare. He pressed his own hand against the scanner panel. I have a bad feeling about this. A third asterisk appeared on the screen. He dropped his hand to the lever on the side of the device and pulled. Ooh, that door be opening. The door opened with a heavy metallic groan. No! He <laughs> let go of Clover. Wait! Jinpei left towards the night man, but he wasn't fast enough. A man shoved Clover. <laughs> and hopped through the door. Okay. Oh, he be leaving? Have a good one, guys. I'm going off ahead now. Well then. Goodbye. He raised his hand and waved a twisted smirk on his face. Like I said, I have a bad feeling about this. Then he was gone. The door ground shut with a dull clang of metal on metal. Glover! You all right? Snake ran to Clover's side as she lay on the floor. Y yeah, I'm fine. She climbed unsteadily to her feet and once there leaned heavily on Snake's shoulder for support. Junpei ran to the door. The others followed him. Several pairs of hands grabbed hold of the handles and pulled. They grunted and strained, but... Ain't no good. Crap! It won't budge. That was when Lotus, the dancer, spoke. Her voice was quiet. Do you hear something? Like what? Like some kind of beeping. Junpei pressed his ear against the cold metal of the door. The others did the same. You're right. I can hear it too. What is it? Then they heard something else. It was the ninth man. Shit! Why isn't this stopping? God damn it! Y you lied! Lied? This wasn't supposed to happen! This is wrong. This is wrong! His voice shook with fear. Safe on the outside, they stepped back from the door and looked at one another. What is happening in there? Slender Man, probably. Oh, open the door! Please, I'm begging you! Help me! Please, get me out of here! Get me out of here! Junpei grabbed hold of the device. It's, he slammed his hand on the scanner panel. Nothing happened. Why didn't it register him? He looked at the display where the asterisk had shown up. It said engaged. My God. Oh my God. There's no time left. Listen. I was lied to. He lied to me. He put me here. It was him. He killed me. It was him. Whoa! The explosion rocketed the room. Instinctively, they ducked and shook stood up slowly when they realized there was no danger. No one spoke. Silence filled the room. In that silence, the electronic tone that echoed across the room sounded as loud as a gunshot. All eyes turned toward it. It had come from the device mounted next to the door. The display changed from engaged to vacant. Uh, let's see if we can open it. Seven, the mountain, swallowed hard. Jinpei nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. A red asterisk appeared on the LCD panel. The device had registered Jinpei's bracelet number five. His was not enough, however. At least two more people were needed. Junpei asked, Which pair? Um... Well, I'd say... Wait, what is going on here? 
Uh, well, obviously, since this is the choice I picked before, it's Santa and June. I mean, if you know anything about digital roots, then you know it's that. Santa and, uh, June, you think you can give me a hand here? The pun was a little too on the nose, but the mood was still grim. Both Santa and June lifted their left hands silently. He verified, and she followed suit. 5 plus 3 plus 6 equals 14, 1 plus 4 equals 5. They had fulfilled the conditions. If they were to pull the lever on the side... Are you guys ready? I'm gonna open it. Junpei grabbed the lever and looked back over his shoulder. They stiffened and nodded. Junpei nodded back and set his mouth in a grim line. Then he slowly lowered the lever. There was a metallic groan and the door slid open. A breath of air drifted out of it, carrying a stench that nearly made them gag. Junpei grimaced and put a hand over his mouth. Oh my god. Good god. Lotus and Ace shuddered. Seven grunted. Whoa. That's... That's pretty bad. Even Santa's voice shook. He... He blew up. It appeared that Santa was right. The hallway on the other side of the door was splattered with chunks of torn flesh and dark red blood. Whoa! That sucks. Shriek echoed across the room. I can't say he didn't deserve it, though. The guy was kind of a creeper. It had come from June. Then, her strength left her, and she dropped. As Junpei turned to catch her, the door groaned shut. She crumpled to the floor. June, you okay? Junpei dropped to his knees and put his arm around her shoulders. That was when he noticed. Her whole body was feverish. She was radiating intense heat. What the hell? Where did this fever come from? June didn't answer. Her face looked like wax and her whole body began to shake. All right, let's just rest for a minute, okay? You think you can walk? She nodded weakly. Junpei lifted June to her feet and guided her to a nearby chair. Here we go. As gently as he could, he set her down in it. How are you feeling? Are you alright? She nodded, and as she did, a single huge tear rolled down the side of her face. Why? Why did this happen? Her voice cracked, broken by misery and grief, and choked by sobs. Why did this happen? Junpei spun around. Do any of you know what the freak is going on on here? Who's Zero? What's this nonary game? Come on, anyone? Anything? What the hell's going on? Why are we doing here? No one spoke. Ace, Snake, Santa, Clover, Seven, and Lotus. They simply stood there, seven pairs of downcast eyes and seven grim lines for mouths. June's body shook with silent sobs. They slowed as the minutes ticked by and eventually they stopped. Then suddenly, in the cold, heavy silence that had enveloped them like a thick fog, a bell began to ring. The clock in the central hall. Seven, eight, nine, ten times. They lost an hour just waiting for this guy to blow up. And then on the tenth ring, it stopped. The sound of the bell faded away into silence. It's ten o'clock, then. Ace said what each one of them had been thinking. That means it's been an hour since Zero's little announcement. Seven's deep voice echoed across the room. Fuck! I've had enough of this crap! Santa leapt to his feet, his fist clenched. How long are we gonna pussyfoot around like this? We've only got eight hours until this time limit Zero was going on about is up. Let's get going already! Go! Go! Santa's outburst fell, outburst fell on deaf ears. No one seemed to agree with him. They stared back at him, their eyes blank and their faces tired. Finally, Lotus spoke. No. I refuse. I'm not going to end up like him. Him? You mean the ninth man? Of course. Who else? 
In his mind's eye, Jinpei saw the corpse again. The dark reddish-black pool of blood. The scattered pieces of flesh. Organs strewn across the floor like the blossoming of a grotesque flower. The explosion that had torn through his body had been powerful. The ninth man's neck had been twisted at an odd angle. Junpei suspected the detonation had thrown him against the wall. Half of his face was crushed, and the other half was covered in blood. Most of his abdomen had been emptied, either by explosion or by gravity. He had landed on his back, and a stark white rib jutted up out of his chest, like the legs of some sort of macabre crab. Ew. Junpei felt something flip in his stomach. I think he just... screwed up. Eyebrows went up, and Santa continued. He probably set off some sort of trap, and that killed him. I'm not gonna screw up like that. I'm getting out of here alive. <laughs> Whatever Snake was laughing at, Santa did not find particularly humorous. What's so goddamn funny? Oh, my apologies. You were just so very confident. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> what the fuck? I think you've mistaken the situation. Huh? The ninth man death. It had nothing to do with the trap. Or at least, not the sort of trap you imagine it did. <laughs> then... He broke one of Sarah's rules. That was why he died. Quite simple if you think about it. Huh? You still don't. Alright. How about you take a moment and think back to what Zero said. Specifically, what did he say about a number of people? He said only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. Right? And after that, you've gotten the relevant part. What did Zero say? Santa furrowed his brow and thought. Jinpei thought back. Zero said... That everyone, obviously everyone in Verified can go through because I'm not stupid and I picked this option before. Yeah. All those who enter must leave and all who enter must contribute. Right? I think it was something like that. Whatever it was, it means that groups of less than three or more than five can't go. Through. Can't go through. That is correct. Good boy, Junpei. You get a cookie. A gold star for you, Junpei. Or a gold star, in that case. Snake inclined his head towards Junpei. The ninth man, however, broke that rule. That was why he was executed. And Zero's watching us from somewhere. Making sure we don't break any rules. Oh, I'm not sure of that. Well, why not? Because this execution system is entirely automatic. You did no ties? There is no need for him to monitor us. What do you mean? Snake looked at Seven with what can only be described as pity and sighed. Very well. I see it must be me who tells you. I've waited long enough, I suppose. I had hoped Zero might spare me the trouble, but... That seems increasingly unlikely. He couldn't see them, of course, but perhaps Snake sensed the confused eyes upon him. When Ace spoke, he gave words to everyone else's thoughts. Do you know something? Well, I know a great many things, but... Yes. What is it you know? Here. Snake removed a card from the pocket of his jacket. With a flourish, he presented it to Ace, who took a close look at it and spoke. Come on now. What's the point of giving me this? Let me guess, it's in Braille? Give me that! Santa snatched the card from Ace, but his expression of disgust quickly turned to one of confusion. Huh? The hell is this? Seven tugged it out of Santa's hands. <laughs> I see. The card went from Seven to Lotus, from Lotus to June, and finally to Junpei. He looked at it and understood. I knew it was in Braille. This is Bra this is Braille. Braille, the written language of the blind. The card was covered with small embossed bumps. 
Junpei could recognize it, but he certainly couldn't read it. Sorry, guys, I can't read this. Junpei handed the card back to Snake, who nodded at him with a small smirk. Okay, that was fun. What's so important about that card? I found it in my pocket. I can only assume it was a message from Zero. From Zero? A message? What does it say? Suddenly everyone was crowding around Snake, desperate to hear what the message said. Santa especially looked as if he were about to grab a hold of Snake and shake the answers from him. Snake raised his hand. Calm down now. No need to panic. You don't need to force me. I'll read it. Junpei swallowed hard and waited for him to start. He was not the only one. Presently, Snake began to read, his voice calm. His fingers glided over the tiny bumps as he spoke. Bracelet number two. Since you are not blessed with sight, I shall bless you, and only you, with information. I shall tell you the function of the R.E.D., of the D.E.A.D., and of the bracelet. The red is a recognition device. It will verify your number. Beside every number door, you will find a red. The dead is the deactivation device. It does exactly what it says. Once you have passed through the number door, you must use the deck to sell the detonator in your bracelet. But perhaps you are wondering, what does this detonator detonate? I'm afraid this may be something of a surprise. I have placed a small bomb inside of you and the people whom you are about to meet. You swallowed it while you were unconscious. I have no doubt that by the time you read this note, the bomb will have passed your stomach and found its way to your small intestine. In other words, you will be unable to regurgitate it. I suggest you do not try. As I mentioned before, the bracelet on your left hand contains a detonator. Think of it as a remote fuse or a timer for the bomb in your body. There is only one condition which will cause it to detonate. That condition is that you enter a number door. Once you have done so, the timer will activate no matter who you may be. You will have 81 seconds. If, after that time, the detonator has not been deactivated, it will send a signal to the bomb in your body, instructing it to explode. In order to deactivate the detonator, every person who verified the number at the red must also verify the numbers of the dead. Once all numbers have been verified by the dead, you need only pull the lever at its side, and the countdown will cease. Anyone who does not verify their number at the red will find themselves unable to verify their number at the dead. That is to say, if you should pass through a number door without first verifying your number at the red, in 81 seconds you will be dead. You must also keep in mind that the number doors will close automatically after 9 seconds have passed. So long as the door is open, the dead will not function. You will do well to remember this. Lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship or detects that its various heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. There is no other way to remove your bracelet. If you attempt to force it off or disable the detonator, the bomb within you will immediately explode. That is all the information which I can impart to you. How you choose to use it is for you to decide. If used wisely, you can eliminate those who might be in danger for you. For a time, you would be able to control your fate. I wish you the best of luck. Snake finished reading and carefully returned the card to his pocket. The message had been lengthy, but its meaning was clear. Only those who verified their numbers at the red could pass through the numbered doors. Teams could not increase or decrease their numbers. The Reds, Deads, and the Bracelets enforced the rules. They were judge, jury, and executioner. In defiance of Zero's suggestions, both Santa and Seven put fingers down their throats and began to gag. You just said you couldn't do that, idiots. Santa probably does that outside the game. The rest stiffened. Some touched their stomachs, some simply stared at their bracelets. Junpei gingerly touched his stomach. There was a bomb inside his body. The thought of it made him queasy. His stomach felt oddly hollow, and his legs were weak. Why had Zero designed such a ludicrous game? 
Junpei looked over at the others. All right, I'm going to ask one more time. Do any of you know anything about Zero? They were all silent, each person waiting to hear what the others would say. Finally, Santa spoke. Actually, I... I saw him. I saw Zero when I got grabbed. I didn't see his face, though. Then what good are you? Son of a bitch was wearing some kind of gas mask. What the hell? Come on, guys. Give me something. You know, like, surprise or something. Instead, it was Santa who looked surprised. There was a moment of silence, and then everyone spoke at once. Yeah, I saw him too. Me too. It was wearing a gas mask! As stories were sorted out, the truth became clear. All of their stories were the same. They had been abducted at home and at midnight. The person claiming to be Zero had worn a mask. There had been white smoke, and then each person had passed out. When they awoke, they had found themselves on D-Deck in a room with three level bunk beds. Only seven stories seemed to lack the detail of the others. Oh, oh uh, me? Yeah, well, mine was just like the rest of yours. That was all he had said. It had occurred to Junpei at the time that it sounded somewhat strange, but he didn't press the issue. He hadn't done so because there was something that struck him as even stranger. That was the mystery of the relationship between Snake and Clover. For some reason, they had been abducted from the same room and woken up in the same room. Junpei looked at them thoughtfully. What's the deal? So what's the deal with two of you anyway? It was Clover that answered. Clearly, she felt she had nothing to hide. We're siblings. Siblings? Uh, yes. Snake is my older brother, obviously. That means I'm his little sister. Is that really so hard to understand? Junpei was taken aback. She looks like a freaking strawberry shortcake doll in that sprite position. <laughs> the others seemed just as surprised. She's correct. <laughs> Even Snake's like, what the heck? Just kidding. He had laid his hand on Clover's shoulder. Are you surprised? Well, yeah, but, uh... Oh. Well, all the people here with connections to one another. Those two, for instance. Snake pointed at Junpei and June. Oh, you mean between Jumpy and me? Ah, oh, yes. You did say you were childhood friends, didn't you? You went to school together? Y yeah June glanced at Junpei, uncomfortable with the sudden attention. Junpei felt somewhat nervous as well and tried to scratch his head as casually as possible. Hey, you think maybe we could figure out who Zero is this way? Yeah, you're right. You connect the dots between the victims, and that leads you to the perp. It's textbook stuff. Junpei, June. Does any of this ring a bell? Ring a bell? Ring a bell? They looked at one another. And like it was staged, they both tilted their neck at the same time. Oh, that's adorable. Well, perhaps you went to school with the son of a multimillionaire. A millionaire? Son? Well, someone bought the boat and set up all of... this. Whoever Zero is, they must be incredibly rich. Well, we can't be sure of that. To me, this seems as though it's a work of an organization, not an individual. Zero is most likely simply the representative of a larger group. What sort of organization? It could be a number of things. An army, perhaps. Or a research group. Perhaps this is all some sort of psychological experiment. If it is, then it's a pretty fucked up experiment. I mean, come on! A guy's dead! 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 The word dead hung in the air, heavy and ominous. The room went quiet again. I don't know who the hell this Zero asshole is, but I know for sure he's gotta be pretty fucked up in the head to do all this. If this was all one guy, then he's got some serious issues. 
And so he does. Maybe we might find out some of those issues next episode. Rate, comment, subscribe, favorite. See you guys next time.